This is Power of the Street, a podcast series brought to you by Human Rights Watch about how we speak truth to power. I'm Audrey Kawire Wabwire and I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. In the previous episode, we spoke to Nigerian filmmaker Kiki Modi, who produced an award-winning documentary about sex for grades in Nigeria and Ghana's universities. And in this episode, we take the conversation to Malawi. Everyone we speak to in the series has a second, a minute, or an hour when they realize that they need to make a change. The moment when they decide to step up and rise. Honestly, I don't even remember not being this way. <laughs> and I can't imagine not being this way. I don't know. I just know uh, growing up, I had a lot of questions. And uh, to a certain extent, my parents allowed me to ask those questions. But of course, there, there, were, there was always that issue of, oh, you're being rude, or also manage how you talk to uh, your elders, etc. But there were just some things I didn't understand. Why is my brother being led to play and I have to stay and wash the dishes and stuff like that? That's Lusungu Kalanga a Malawian feminist, activist, and gender and development practitioner. So I'm going to go through some of your accomplishments and some of the things you're taking up. Yeah, so you're a fellow in the very prestigious Mandela Washington program. Um, you're also in the Moremi Initiative uh, program, which we'll talk about too. And your activism has really been centered around girls' access to education. Um, and you're also podcasting, producing the show Feministing while Malawian. Clearly, yeah. Yeah, you care so much about women's rights. So let's just go back all the way to the beginning, to the moment when you began your activism. Why did you decide to stand up for women's rights and girls' education? My dad happened to be in the development field. I think back in the day, he used to work for one of these big uh, INGOs, World Vision. And uh, sometimes he would take me to the field. And I was just very interested and wondering that, ah, is this really working? And why is this happening like that? So I would ask a lot of questions. And I was very conscious from a young age to just see that mm -mm, I'm not getting the same as this girl in this village, or I'm not getting the same as this person who is working for us, for example, as house help. So, yeah, so it started like that, but I didn't have a name for it. I didn't know there was a thing called activism. I didn't know there was a thing called a feminism. I just knew that I used to say this very cliche word that right now I'm like, never, never. I used to say, I want to, uh, to be the voice for the voiceless. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, but you know how that has now changed. It's like, why do you want to be a voice for the voiceless? They don't have a voice. Did they tell you they don't have a voice? Just pass on the mic, help create the platform. If they don't have access to a space you have, make sure they have that access. That's it. So I think that's how I de it developed. So, uh, but I can I can pinpoint exactly when I thought I'm going to stand up for this. But um, I guess one of the fellowships that you have mentioned, the Moremi Fellowship that we're going to talk about it late, that is the one that really opened my mind to go like, what? Uh, there is a name to my, to my frustrations. There is a name to this Lord. There is a name to this anger that I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then, you know, you went and got your answers from the Moremi um, program. So it's a program that identifies and invites young African women to participate in a year long development program. Could you tell me what your experience was and how this changed your outlook on some of the issues you're talking about? Okay. Uh, so just before Moremi, then I went through university, ETC, and I happened to do sociology. And yeah, it was very theoretical, these issues about mentioning feminism, women's rights, very theoretical. And I thought a bit, some of it was practical, some of it was not. So when I saw this opportunity for a fellowship, I applied. I was like, hmm, this looks like a good space. So when I got there, it was a mixture of Pan-Africanism and feminism, Black feminism. And uh, it just challenged 
uh, everything for me, even the little things, Audrey, like <laughs> relaxing my hair. So I moved from. <laughs> Uh -huh. so you know I was just like wow these are my this is my tribe this is what I've been looking for these answers about structure inequality who did you meet there okay so there were other young uh, uh, young black African women from 24 other countries so one from each country and then the program had curated uh you know some uh very very strong black women like Lema Gobe um uh, the rebellion activists, just her walking and listening to what she was saying. I was like, oh my God, I have, I now have, understand my passion. I understand how I should channel it. What does my identity as a black woman mean? What are the things that are unique to my existence and how can I, uh, how can I own those truths, right? So, and then the Pan-Africanism in it, oh God, it was just a mixture of, it was like an awakening for me. I came back home, I went bored, I cut my hair and I was on fire. <laughs> I was, of course, I've moved from that very extreme spectrum. So, you know, you've come back with fire uh, from the, 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 the Moremi <laughs> Fellowship. And uh, I don't know if that's the time you came back and uh, started your mentorship program. Growing Ambitions, was that? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. so, 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 you know, that's an organization you founded, uh, you're creating, you want to create safe spaces for girls and, you know, give them mentorship. And, you know, that's pretty much the information I'm getting from the website. But why do you think it was, or why did you think at that time that it was necessary to carve out these safe spaces for girls in Malawi? And tell me about the unsafe spaces that, existed you know that drove you to say no i have to do this so uh the reason why i actually qualified for the moremi fellowship was because i had already started on the work the foundation although it had no structure for um uh for to uh for teenage girls especially the ones that uh got uh got pregnant before when they were teenagers so mostly unwanted but sometimes wanted because of peer pressure. So I got interested in that. I was like, okay. Uh, I, at that time, I was working for an orphanage program. So we had these girls in that program. And the message was that once we support them with school fees and groceries, ETC, they want to go to school, right? So we were sponsoring these girls and the <laughs> rates of uh, pregnancies were not going down. So. Uh, so yeah, so I decided let me have let me start conversations to hear what uh, what it is really about. That's when I started unveiling how and how most of them didn't even have a choice in even just having pleasurable sex, like uh, even the way their parents treated them, even the role models that were around them. They didn't see anyone going beyond maybe primary school, or they didn't see. Uh, they didn't see education as a key to poverty like we saw it. So we're very prescri prescriptive in that, that we did not offer them uh, that space to express themselves and explain to us how they felt. So, um, and also a lot of the spaces uh, that are there right now for uh, young, young women in Malawi uh, before, uh, I can say confidently right now that organizations like Growing Ambitions have mushroomed all over Malawi, which is which can only be a good thing. But when we were starting out, we didn't have that many. And the conversations that were very popular then were about experimental sex, not enough comprehensive sexual and reproductive health, nothing to do with uh, feminism. Of course, not feminism as the name, but feminist conversations as the, as the adjective you know so right now if you talk to the girls they are very <laughs> they are very fired up now they're learning from each other they are assertive they're confident right now we have about 50 girls in our program yeah that is so so impressive and you know I, um, I, I, was, I was just thinking you know when people talk about teen pregnancies the girl is usually described as you know she's not well mannered and we really shame her and there's no support for them from the community or even their families yet as you say many times when the girl is pregnant it's 
from rape from a family member, a neighbor, or you know, just someone in their, uh, someone close to them. And even when it's consensual, um, there's, as you're saying, no comprehensive sexual education. Uh, you're thinking about a lot of this in your work. Tell me about how um, these two relate. Exactly. So it's how the patriarchy works, right? Uh, because when you hear about uh, teenage pregnancies, you hear about rape, you rarely see a picture of the perpetrator uh, unless we make noise about it, that where's the perpetrator? Why are you putting the picture of the girl who's pregnant? Who made this girl pregnant? Even when we're talking about uh, child marriages, where are the men that are marrying these girls? If we say it's 50%, where are they? Where are they? So I think I just feel like it's the way the patriarchy works, right? Uh, that our bodies are very much like objects and that very much policed. If um, if a if a girl gets pregnant, she faces backlash. She's called loose etc. If uh, and yet a man all the time is told to experiment, have fun. Who are they going to experiment on? They're going out and. Uh, doing all these experiments on girls who are who do not give informed consent because i always question this thing about consent to say okay sometimes we just say oh it was consensual so it's fine but was it informed did this girl know that she has option a b and c if she did not know then it's not informed consent and it should not be tolerated so i just feel like we as a society have a lot to do in terms of Blessing the responsibility and blame right where it lies. And it is on people who make girls pregnant. It is on um, the men who rape. It is not on the girls or the women. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely correct. And there's also the fact that children need information. They need to know about informed consent. They need to know how their body works and, you know, what's right for them and, you know, what, what's not right for them. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's, that's something I think about a lot, but let's, let's, let's come back to your upbringing. <laughs> You're telling me how you are exposed to different inequalities, um, you know, when you'd go with your dad to the field when he was working. So how much has, uh, how much influence has your family had on your activism and how do they respond to it? Or, you know, maybe they support it. How do they do that? <laughs> yeah, so my family have <laughs> wow, actually uh one of the most interesting things my dad told me was that Lusu, I'm so glad I raised you the way I raised you. You are strong, you're independent, but sometimes I regret. I feel like you are too independent. <laughs> and this feminist <laughs> I was like, I didn't realize there was supposed to be a degree of uh, independence. But yeah, so to mention, my family are supportive to the extent that they can be because um, I come from a very religious family. So my mom is a pastor and not just a pastor, like uh, a prophetess. And my dad, as far as I remember, he's always been an elder in church. And my sister is a pastor's wife. So uh, to just find that balance... <laughs> They are always, like, for example, when I go on the streets uh, demonstrating, my dad would be like, please, okay, you can go, but please stand in the back. Oh, please don't don't say kalanga. Don't use our son. I'm like, I will say, hello, Abnusungu kalanga. <laughs> Sometimes I feel when they, when they give these instructions and then they see me, for example, if they see me on TV, they see me somewhere, they'll say, oh, look. So this is dangerous, but I can see some sort of pride in their eyes. They're like, oh, we are, we are proud of you. But at the same time, sometimes, uh, for example, if I'm talking about uh, legalizing abortions, mm. they're like, okay, we, we, we are Christians, you know, what I mean? but I'm like, it's about human rights. Come on now. When I'm uh, talking about LGBTQI plus uh, rights, it's like, uh, yeah, so they're supportive to the extent that they they can be. Let, let's let's talk about the, the the protests again. You know, I was listening to uh, your podcast, Feministing Wild Malawi, and, and you were talking about the protest, which is called Take It to the Streets. Um, and it was a protest against violence against women. And so 
now in this space when we're talking about me, the Me Too movement on the continent. And one thing that has become more common is women's uprising by protests online and also offline. That's, you know, going to the streets. But, um, you know, even before we go deeper into that, I wanted to discuss street harassment, which I know you've been talking about a lot, and how it limits women's freedom. You know, you're walking home, you're walking uh, out, you're know, enjoying the day, and then you hear, ksk, 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 hey, baby, hey, sweetie, you know, and other disgusting things, um, followed by whistle. Then it's so annoying and even scary because if you don't respond, or if maybe you respond, you never know what can really trigger violence at that moment. And you're just afraid. What's your experience of this? Oh my God, I don't even know where to start from. Every time I'm, I'm on the street, for example, if I'm taking a walk as an exercise or I'm running, I have to brace myself. Just, you know, the body, you always breathe in, <laughs> you go out, you breathe out when you come home. But there's never been a time when there's no any there's no some sort of street harassment. And I usually tell this story of when I put my friend and I in danger because uh, we were walking like uh, we were walking as an exercise, and then there was this car that slowed down, and uh, there were these two very drunk men, and of course a woman was driving. So this man takes out like the, his body, his upper body out, and then he starts speaking all this nonsense, commenting on our bodies, questioning why we are exercising, etc. And uh, so I'm left-handed, and um, I'm also I'm also a bit short-tempered when <laughs> such things happen. A bit, <laughs> but. Uh, on this day, I picked up a rock. Without it happened within maybe ten seconds. I picked up a rock and I threw it. Hey. And of course, yeah, I missed, but I I hit the car. So they stopped and then they came out and actually threatened to physically harm us. So we we're lucky that there were other people around that were hearing this that didn't feel feel the need to comment when we we're being harassed. But at least they tried to protect us. They tried to protect us when these guys were like, why did you do that? And so I was like, you know what you did. You were harassing us and you made me angry. So, yeah. But then I realized and started feeling very guilty because I had uh, put myself and my friend in danger. But then at the same time, I was like, I am the one who is carrying this burden of feeling guilty. But then there was who harassed me. And then on top of that, threaten to cause physical harm to us. <laughs> so it's like, oh my God, we are stuck between a rock and a hard place when it comes to street harassment. You don't respond, you can be in danger. You respond, you can be in danger. Yeah, and you know, I, I follow many conversations where African women are speaking out against you know all kinds of harassment, street harassment, uh, sexual violence things like that and i'm seeing that the internet is becoming an outlet where many women are feeling like this is a safe space for us to uh talk about what we're going through especially where judicial processes are not accessible or when they're even abusive to survivors so online activism which was once seen as so elitist for people who have money, maybe they're becoming important organizing spaces for protests. But I'd like to hear your opinion on the two, uh, the street protests, like the one you took part in and the, the impact of the online space on this match. Mm. So uh, really, actually, uh, the take it to the streets uh, protests generated from online protests, right? The hashtag take it to the street. So, of course, for example, in Malawi, this one, this particular one was triggered by a young lady who, uh, in the other city, Blanta, she was uh, stripped off of her clothing and harassed, sexually harassed, because she was apparently wearing a miniskirt. So, if, and then we had, uh, we, as always, there are always all these cases of uh, rape, of children, of uh, young women, old women, it's everyone. So people were like, guys, uh, I remember it was uh, the president of uh, Young Feminist Network, a really, really young, 22-year-old um, fierce feminist that I also even look up to. 
Uh, so she said, should we take it to the streets? And then from there, we started saying, let's take it to the streets. And the organizing for the offline protest happened right there online. We took it from Twitter. We took it to WhatsApp. On WhatsApp, more structured. These are the materials. So and so has said they can provide this ETC. And then the physical meetings happened. Uh, on the day of the protest, in terms of visibility and uh, reaching other African feminists, even uh, Northern feminists joining uh, in retweeting helped us to, you know, to amplify the voice of what was happening like we always do, for example, when Me Too happens in different countries and such uh, women's march happening in different countries. So I feel both spaces serve their purpose and both spaces are really important. You know, you, you, are, you were handling so many things last year and, you know, the pandemic is just putting this extra... Um, layer of stress and pain. Um, how are you taking care of yourself? I know you've said this year you're not carrying the world on your shoulders. So how are you doing that? How are you actively saying that, you know, this is how I'm caring for me? Yeah, so because uh, <clears throat> in my kind of work and uh, especially now that now I've moved more into um uh, really working on issues of norm change to, uh, you know, in terms of violence against women and girls and also supporting survivors. The vicarious trauma is always there. It's always there because uh, you are experiencing whatever they're experiencing. So uh, I think one of my self-care processes is to read. I like to detach and disappear. So I'll be honest, Audrey, I really find nonfiction hard to read, meaning... <laughs> <laughs> it makes me, <laughs> but I read it because, you know, if you are a feminist, you have to continuously learn, you have to continuously read, but I enjoy fiction. I like disappearing in, you know, in different worlds. And I, I, I must say a lot of African, uh, African writers are really doing the work in terms of writing and yeah. And a lot of women writers, it's so nice. And, um, and also this year, this year I'm going to therapy. So I've always wanted to go back to therapy because I feel like, oh, it's very beneficial. And I talk a lot to myself. So I feel like therapy uh, is going to also help me this year. And I also do a lot of gardening. I took it from my mom. I'm my plant mom. I've killed a couple, but the ones that are alive are surviving. <laughs> and then outside, I also have a flower garden that I like to, you know, just get uh, disappear in and yeah oh that is that is so so beautiful yes to therapy and r.i.p to lusungu's few plants uh we hope the rest will grow <laughs> i hope the rest exactly. will grow. i hope the rest will grow and just to wind up do you have a message for other women who are driving the me too movement in africa uh firstly is to say uh uh, take care of uh, take care of yourself. Let's take care of each other. And uh, self care is an act of resistance. I like uh, articles and some of the uh, I think uh, the guidelines that uh, one of my favorite African feminists has produced, uh, Jessica Horn, like uh, guidelines self care and not just self care but also collective care because we're in this together. Don't carry the load on your own and it's okay to switch off to say you know what i i need to prioritize myself because uh, i find that a lot of activists don't do that because we are driven by we understand the urgency but uh we cannot pour into the world when we are empty so it's always important to always keep uh, taking a step back and prioritize our self-care and also collective care Honestly, black women have been carrying the world for such a long time. I, I just feel like that should be uh, prioritized. So uh, I'd like you to tell uh, people who are listening about your podcast and about your amazing work and where they can find you online. You can find uh, our podcast, Feministing or Malawian, on Twitter. So it's at feministingwm. And then... Uh, for the work of Growing Ambitions, you can uh, find us on Twitter as well. It's uh, at Growing Ambition. And my uh, my personal handle on Twitter is at Lusu Kalanga. So I'm not, I'm not on Facebook. I'm very much a Twitter person. 
uh, feel free to connect with me on there and yeah you've been listening to power of the streets a podcast series brought to you by human rights watch i'm audrey kawire wabwire that's the end of our show. Check out our show notes for more about Lusungu and her work at Growing Ambitions and her podcast, Feministing While Malawian. In the next episode, we take the conversation to Uganda. To learn more about Human Rights Watch, visit hrw.org. Follow us on Twitter at hrw and on Instagram at Human Rights Watch for updates about the show. Join the conversation using the hashtag Power of the Streets and share your thoughts with Lusungu or any of our other guests and you can tell us how you're speaking truth to power. Our producer is Andy Siwe May and this is a volume production. The main theme song, Au Revoir, is produced by Young OG Beats. Till next time, thank you for listening.